Our Father, we bless your name because of the fact that Jesus Christ lives. And because he lives, we have pardon. Because he lives, we have fellowship with God. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Father, we pray that as we recognize the fact that Jesus lives, we will surrender our all to him so we can live with him. We pray that as we go into the word tonight, you write this word upon our hearts and help us by your grace and by the power in the blood of Jesus Christ to live according to the teaching of the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 to 30. We have been spending some time with the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ that he gave on the mount. And this particular section of the Sermon on the Mount deals with keeping pure inwardly and outwardly with particular emphasis and teaching on keeping ourselves pure from immorality. Then it touches too on Christian teaching on the institution of marriage. So as we study through these verses up to verse 32 in a number of weeks, we'll teach all that the believer ought to know on Christian marriage from the time he finds the will of God, we'll show on how to find the will of God and how to go about making that will of God known to all the parties involved through the time of the courtship, to the time of the wedding, then to the family life. But today we want to clear the ground before the blessing of God can come upon us. If you examine the way God deals with individuals, with nations, with communities of people, you will discover that he first blesses the individual and he draws that individual into a union with himself in a covenant relationship then after the blessing he follows by commandment and that commandment is given to keep you in the blessing of God then that commandment is given in its law as to manifest obedience towards God in that commandment he gives you added blessing And so we look at this commandment today that God has given. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27, 28, 29, and 30, we read, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, 
and not that the whole body should be cast into hell, into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. Jesus mentioned the fact that you have heard that it had been said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. And obviously you have heard from of old, even before you started coming for fellowship, or going to church, or attending Bible study, that thou shalt not commit adultery. If you studied catechism when you were young, you heard of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you were not a Christian, and therefore you did not study catechism, and you were a Muslim, you saw elders, in homes accusing a Muslim fellow of committing adultery with a wife of another Muslim. And so you too, as a Muslim, you heard, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you are an atheist, neither a churchgoer nor a Muslim, obviously you read in the papers that Mr. So and So charged so-and-so in the court because he committed adultery with his wife. So too, you have heard of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you did not know how to read and you developed in the village, obviously you have seen meetings in villages when the chief of the village will be called and a man will be brought into the midst of some elders in the village and they will say, this man committed adultery with my wife. And he might have been fined or he might have been put to shame by the villagers. So too, as a villager, not knowing how to read or write, not going to church, you have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you have been in family meetings, you have recognized when so-and-so, an uncle to Mr. So-and-so, made a wife in the extended family pregnant, and therefore all the members of the family were called together. And this Mr. So-and-so was called into question. These were not religious meetings, these were just family meetings in the extended family. And they brought the pregnant woman into the midst. And they said, what did you do? Until they got the confession out of him. So if you have been in such a family meeting, even though you did not hear in church, you heard at the extended family meeting, thou shalt not commit adultery. If your case wasn't like that, and you went to a co-educational school, you remember at school when a class 4 boy was called into the principal's office and he was questioned and beaten until he confessed and another class 2 girl was brought into the picture because they had done wrong. They call it fornication. It's a branch of immorality that is a branch or in the family of adultery. You remember that solemn uh, morning at the assembly when that assembly was prolonged and they brought the two of them outside and the principal declared that their educational career was stopped and your principal was declaring to you, thou shalt not commit adultery. And so wherever you are, church goer, church member, Muslim, pagan, atheist, 
a school boy or school girl, Jesus said, and he spoke the truth, that ye have heard, that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. In particular, Jesus referred to the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 20, reading from verse 1 to verse 3, And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That is the blessing. God gives the blessing first. He draws his people close. He forgives all their transgressions and all their iniquities. He makes them his own children. And after that blessing, he begins to give out commandments. In verse 3, he says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And in verse 14, he said, Thou shalt not commit adultery. What he said to Moses, he said to Aaron. What he said to Aaron, he said to Miriam. What he said to Miriam, he said to Dathan, Korah, and Abiram. What he said to these three people, he said to the 250 elders. What he told the 250 elders, he told the 12 spies that went to Canaan to spy out the land of Canaan, among whom are Caleb and Joshua. What he told these twelve, he told the seventy that received uh, the Spirit of God that was on Moses. What he told these seventy, he told all the children of Israel in the millions. He said unto every one of them, from Moses up on down to the youngest person in Israel, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And what he told Israel, he tells the church and tells the world today. And what is it? Thou shalt not commit adultery. It is what he tells the pastor. He tells members of the choir. He tells the choir master. He tells the Sunday school teachers. He tells all the people who listen to the word of God. And what he says in the Anglican. He says in the Presbyterian. He says in the CMS church. He says in the Methodist, he says in the CAC, Apostolic Faith and Fourth Choir, Gospel Faith Mission and Redeemed Christian Church of God. And he tells all the people studying the Bible under the deeper Christian life ministry, saying, Thou shalt not commit adultery. And when God says so, he means it. And he stands at the back of that word to punish whoever, however high, however low, that will disobey or disregard that commandment of God. Thou shalt not commit adultery. A man of influence who can damn the consequence, drive his way through so that the court cannot find him, so that the husband of the woman will not be able to imprison him, still has God as the judge. For God has told all human beings, Thou shalt not commit adultery. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 2 to 7, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in holy. The Lord made not this covenant with our fathers, but with us, even us, who are all of us here alive this day. The Lord talketh, taught with you face to face, in the mount, that's Mount Sinai, out of the midst of the fire, I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord. For ye were afraid by reason of the fire and went not off into the mount, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. And in verse 18, neither shalt thou commit adultery, school teacher, neither shalt thou commit 
adultery. You hold evening classes for primary school girls, holding evening classes for secondary school girls. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You may who have houses outside where you live, and you have the finance to rent a room for a woman outside. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Ladies who have no other work but the work of prostitution and are even getting paid on disobedience by disobeying God, they make profession out of that and they are even getting paid, paying for their rent, paying for their food by disobedience against this command of God. He says to you too, thou shalt not commit adultery. He gave out the blessing, then he gave out the commandment. It was the same thing he did to Abraham. He blessed him, then he called out to him and he said, I am your God, I am your shield, walk thou before me and be thou perfect. After the blessing, commandment. If you have been coming here and the Lord has blessed you, he has saved you, he has healed you, he has blessed you in various ways, all the more reason why you ought to listen to the commandment of the Lord. Thou shalt not commit adultery. If you are going to receive other blessings from the Lord, you have to stop at this mild post of the commandment of God. After you have obeyed, he will give you other blessings. Some people wonder, I've been praying and I can't get healed. Well, you have been saved. After you were saved, he expected you will obey his commandment. You would have been healed long ago. Others have been praying for life partner. And they say they want this blessing from the Lord. I want the Lord to give me a life partner. Well, he's giving you one blessing already. He saved your soul. Perhaps he has done other things. He expects that after that blessing, commandment will follow. It is after you have obeyed that commandment that another blessing that you are looking for will follow. And so, if you want the Lord to bless you, if you are seeking for the will of God, you cannot find the will of God. The Lord cannot reveal His choice, His time, His blessing unto you until you listen to this commandment of the Lord. As it ever occurred to you, that this is a commandment that makes us different from animals. God never speaks to animals, but he speaks to us human beings. Because we are the cow of his creation. And this commandment that he has given to man, he never gave to animals. That's why you notice if you have, if you have chickens, hens, around you in your home, they don't think of adultery. They just meet anyhow. If you have noticed dogs, there is no shame among them about it. The next dog they come across, if they feel like having anything to do with that dog, they just meet right in the open as you are passing by. And there are people who are public dogs. They make themselves human beings. But public dogs, they can commit immorality right in the open. Do you know? that in civilized America, civilized countries, you can even watch, ad uh, watch adultery being committed right over the TV. Human beings can commit adultery and it can be televised and you'll be looking at them. They are saying, we have gone down so low like public dogs and there is no shame at all. Other people can take pictures that are completely naked and they put it right at the crossroads, perhaps on the highway, on the Kodu Road. And in nakedness, they sit near a fan. They are telling you that they don't have anything to do with the word of God. People can see their pictures and lust after them. After all, didn't Jesus say, if you look on a woman to lust after her, in your heart you have committed adultery in your heart. You know, there is a particular newspaper on a particular page. If you are the type that is um, the sinful in the sinful community and you are following the sins of the world, 
There is that particular page you open, and you are sure to see somebody's daughter that didn't have home training when they were young, didn't read catechism, didn't read the Bible, and has neglected God long, long ago. Obviously, a drop out because if you're educated and you have work, you'll not be taking naked pictures to make a living. But people who are dropped out in society and who cannot get anybody to marry, you know, if somebody is married, the wife, the husband will caution the person not to go and sit um, naked before a photographer and put that in the public. I don't know how many thousands they produce of um, that newspaper, of the daily paper, maybe 300,000. So the naked picture of that lady will be in the hand of perhaps 2,000 200,000 sinners, and they'll be committing adultery with her in their hearts. Those are people who are no different from animals. I do hope, and I do believe, there is no believer, there is no churchgoer, there is nobody who ever reads the Bible who will pose for a naked picture like that. If you do, you are saying, I am an animal. And I do hope, there is nobody who has ever got saved who said only Jesus can save and later will backslide. Friend, even if a person backslides, remember, they knew you with Jesus. I do hope that if there is a backslider, he'll backslide in secret and he'll get restored to the Lord in secret. He'll not get to that point where he can go out and say, I was a disciple of Jesus, I served Jesus, I witnessed, I used to wear those long dresses that covered my nakedness, but as I was serving the Lord, I now want to serve the devil. I do hope you'll have enough shame. And if you are going to serve, serve in secret. And be praying in secret, saying, Lord, deliver me. But when you go out like that, and you become such a public prostitute, that people can put money on you and gamble on you, and wrestle on you and say, it's me first. And then they'll misuse you, and after that, they won't even look at you twice. They won't even say thank you. And they go their way. They make you an animal. And you have a mother at home crying, where is my daughter? You have a father at home crying, where is my daughter? Or maybe the fathers don't even care because they themselves are drunkards. They themselves have gone away to other women and to other ladies. And therefore like father, like daughter. Like mother, like daughter. And therefore the world is corrupt. But if you people are Christians, I hope there is no Christian with a photographer here who will be taking pictures of prostitutes, pictures of naked women because of money, whatever they are going to pay you. I pray that there is no professional photographer who will so make cheap the name of the Lord and will take part in any of these things. I do hope there is no tailor either who is a Christian who calls upon the name of the Lord and prostitutes will come and sew their professional garments before you. I do hope that if you're a Christian, if you're a child of God, and you're a tailor, seamstress, or wherever you are, whatever your profession, you will not be serving prostitutes. Do you know how bad that type of work is? That you, a believer, will get a machine and will sew prostitutes' clothes or clothes for young girls that will expose them or the unisex that they have and it is the clothes that you sow that will tempt other people to sin. God forbid for members of this ministry. Amen. I hope there is no typist who is working in a hotel. And prostitutes will be misused. And when they want to pay for that hotel, it is you that will type it. If you are, you are a partaker in that sin. And you are guilty of the commandment of the Lord that says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Because you know it that the commandment of God forbids it. You don't do it, but you support them. You have pleasure in them that do them. You are as bad as those who are in breweries, who are making alcohol to make people drunk. Even though you are not drinking yourself, you are producing to make people drunk, you are guilty of that sin. And even though you are not committing adultery, if you are supporting people, you are sharing in that sin. I hope there is nobody who has rented a room or a flat, and any lady, you sisters, will be sharing with you, and then she has no work. When you go to work, she is at home, and it is upon your bed. 
where you have your quiet time, where you call upon the name of the Lord, where you put your Bible, God's own word, that this private prostitute, secret prostitute, will stay back at home, make use of the key to your room, and commit adultery right on your bed that God provided for you. If you are in this ministry, you are a child of God, I hope you are no partaker with anybody in a sin. If you have a brother living with you who will not be serious with the word of God, when you go to work, he says he's living with you and will be bringing what they call girlfriends and partners uh, into that same room of yours. And then they pack all your Bible aside, pack all your cassettes aside, and they make use of your bed sheet, make use of your own bed, and they commit adultery, sinners, those who are serving the devil. And you come back there, you cannot drive them out of your house, or maybe you say you are that so gentle, when they come into the room, you vacate your room for an adulterer. Vacate your room for an adulteress, and they do evil right in your face. God forbid that there are people here who are compromising to such an extent. If you do, you are partaker with them of such an evil. For Jesus did say, you have heard from them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. We ought to be angry against sin. We ought to be angry against immorality. We ought to take our stand that we will not commit the sin. I will not have part with anybody in the sin, no matter who it is. If you are a government official, and maybe you are a secretary, and you have to uh, conduct um, some VIP into some places, well, even though um, we don't go with them, you know what they do in the hotels. You know sometimes it is the government that even pays for all those expenses because there is no question, there is no detail. The um, allowance for the prostitutes, the allowance for the drinking, the allowance for the food, we know that it is not treated as allowance for prostitutes, but you know, you know how they do it. They just say that is um, the allowance for the night. And that includes very many things. And it will give you that record. You will sign it and say that is the allowance. And you know right within you that as a government official, when you go out like that with a VIP, that that is what happens. And you are disobeying the Lord. You are being a partaker in the iniquity and in the sin because of ordinary job. I'd rather quit that job and glorify the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give me Jesus and take away all the things of the world. Secretary, lady, if you are not able to keep your job with your boss, except with keeping it with adultery and fornication, it's better to quit that job. When you are doing something that you cannot disclose to the wife of the boss, it is a straight way to hellfire. For Jesus said, ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. What's the reason for God's commandment? You know that God is love. He never gives out any commandment without a reason and that reason is always love in proverbs chapter 6 from verse 26 i want you to look at all these references intimately and the making up your mind that whoever whoever it is that will lead you into adultery into fornication into lasciviousness into uncleanness into filthiness into foolishness into the loss of the flesh that are going to cut away that person, whoever that person may be. Proverbs chapter 6 from verse 26. For by means of a warish woman, an adulterous woman, a man is brought to a piece of bread. That means a lifeless matter. When you commit adultery or fornication, you lose life and you are brought to just a piece of bread. And the adulteress, will hunt for the precious life. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? You are in courtship. Answer that question. You call it whatever name you call it. You may just say, well, it's ordinary kissing. It's um, just ordinary getting together and just feeling free. 
after all, we are going to get married. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes? That's not just the clothes you put under the garment of righteousness. If you say you are saved, you are putting on the garment of righteousness. If you say you are sanctified, you are putting on the white robe, the white linen, the righteousness of the saints. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? If you are a Bible study leader and you do anything like that, you can go to the corner and snap your fingers. God be merciful to me. Cry a little, weep a little, and come and be back in here like dogs, shouting and quoting scriptures. And you go right back into that scene. You are burnt. Your clothes is burnt. You are naked. You don't have salvation. The garment of righteousness, the garment of praise, the white robe of righteousness is gone. Can a man, can a brother take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can a sister take fire in her bosom and her clothes not be burnt? You pay for it. You call it enjoyment, you call it pleasure, but you lose your clothes. You lose your garments. And the devil comes and he finds you naked. Finding you naked of righteousness, he lays sickness upon your body. And if you make a mistake next Sunday, after that you go to take Holy Communion, you die prematurely. For the Apostle Paul said, many people are weak and sickly. And many people are dead. They fall asleep. Why? Because they go from sin to the communion table. They go, they go from fornication, from adultery, right to the communion table. And when they disobey God like that and they slap God on the face and they walk that abomination, they just begin to die. And you find believers, so-called Christians, dying at 22, dying at 33, dying at 40, even pastors, prophets, prophetess. They are dying by thousands all over the world. Why? Because they are taking fire in their bosom. And their garment of righteousness is burnt and they are naked. And right from that sin they go to the communion table. Oh, you cannot slap God like that in the face and go scot free. That's why they are dying. Look at them in their ladura houses, in the prayer houses. They go right from immorality. And they go to the churchyard drinking bells, singing choruses, clapping their hands and dancing, saying that the Spirit has come upon them. If they make mistakes and go further to serve the communion and they begin to eat the communion and drink, what they say is the blood of the Lord, you just find them dying. Find them dying. Almost every month, you have funeral service in churches. Why? Is the Lord forgetting how to keep? Is the Lord forgetting how to heal? Why? Even gospel churches, people are dying. And almost every time, they do more burial service than wedding ceremony. They do more burial service than child education. Why? Because they go from adultery, from fornication. They may call it romance. They may just call it a little sin that they are doing. But they go right from that sin into the table of the Lord. And the Lord will not take that. He will not take that. If you are still doing it in secret and you are running away saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, God will want to show mercy. He will want to forgive you. He will want to cleanse you. But when you think that, well, you are so bold and you'll be quoting the promises of the Lord, even before some people commit the sin, they'll be quoting the promise of God, that God is merciful. Is he giving you a license to sin? Is he showing you that he'll be merciful just, beca just because you want to satisfy the loss of the flesh? Can you take fire in your bosom and your clothes not be burnt? Verse 28, Can one go upon hot coals and its feet not be burnt? What do you gain from it? The fire is hotter. The punishment is more terrible than whatever you may feel you are going to enjoy. So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever, whosoever touches her, shall not be innocent. Don't say you are sanctified. Don't say you are saved, pastor, when you cancel and you touch the women. You know, it happened at a time in some of the gospel churches. I won't tell you the name of the church, but it happened. One of the pastors told me himself that a fellow pastor in their own church was disciplined and removed from office. Why? A lady was sick. A senior man said, let him call for the elders, let them call for the elders of the church. If ladies are sick, shouldn't they be able to call for the elders of the church? And this woman called for the elder of the church to pray for her. Laying hands upon her, a person who was sick, and he committed adultery. 
with that sick, suffering woman. Human being, selfishness, sinfulness in the heart of man. You want to kill such a person like that when a person is sick and so weak, weak in the body, weak in face and suffering, that she cannot pray for herself and wanting healing and protection, calling the elders of the church. And then a person like that will commit immorality. He is, he will not be innocent. There was another pastor in another church. I won't tell you the church. This one was written in the papers. They didn't tell us the name or the title of that church. Or oh, add a maid. You know a maid? Somebody who carries firewood. Somebody who deals with just the charcoal and will be black all over. With the clothes dirty. Those who commit adultery, they don't know ugliness. They don't know maids. They don't know those who are poor. They don't know illiteracy. Sin will not allow them to make any difference, whatever. And this pastor, a pastor, preaching the gospel, talking about Holy Spirit baptism, talking about healing, talking about Jesus Christ, the sanctifier and the baptizer in the Holy Ghost, talking about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He'll lead courses, he'll lead songs on Sunday, he'll read scripture reading, he'll preach the gospel human beings. How they can go on deceiving themselves. And he was proposing, wanting to commit immorality with this maid. Even the maid was more righteous than the pastor. And the maid rejected. The maid refused until this pastor enticed her and deceived her into the forest and committed immorality with her. And not wanting it to come out, shot the girl and put the girl to death. I mean here in Nigeria, here in Nigeria. And then came back home. Coming back home to do what? To teach Sunday school. <laughs> to teach baptismal class. To serve only communion. And that girl did not die completely and crawled into the wayside in the farm. And people took her up, took her to the hospital. When she recovered, she said, this is what the pastor did. <laughs> Pastors. Can a man go take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? Can we do this in the house of God? And say we're serving God and say Christ is coming back. He's not coming back for adulterers. Not coming back for the adulterers. He's coming back for a clean church. For a pure church. For church without spot, without wrinkle. That is holy, without blemish. Can one go up or not coals and his feet not be burnt? If your feet is shod with the preparation of the gospel, you won't walk on this fire of adultery. If you walk on that fire, your shoe is burnt. And the serpent, the old serpent, the old dragon will bite you in the feet. And your legs, will, your feet will be burnt. So he that goeth in to his neighbor's wife, whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent. Men do not despise a thief. It doesn't say God does not despise a thief. It doesn't say God will not judge the thief. He says men do not despise a thief. If he is still to satisfy his soul when he's hungry. That's not talking about God. That's talking about men. That's talking about lawyers. That's talking about magistrates who will justify sin. Then he goes on to verse 31. But if he be found, and God will always find you out. He shall restore sevenfold. He shall give all the substance of his house. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Don't say you understand theology if you are committing adultery. Don't say you have gone to Bible school if you commit adultery. Don't say you come to Bible school here on Thursday if you commit adultery. Don't say you are coming to workers' retreat and you have understanding if you commit adultery. Don't say you preach sound doctrine if you commit adultery. The word of God says, Whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding, understanding to be saved, understanding to keep saved, Understanding to keep in the way of the Lord. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Not just his substance. Not just his body. He destroyeth his own soul. A wound and a dishonor shall he get. He'll get it. As far as the sun keeps shining, he'll get it. As far as God is still on high, if he does not repent, a wound and dishonor shall he get and his reproach shall not be wiped away. Not in eternity. It will not be wiped away. You can see why God wants to protect us. He doesn't want us to go into all this. And let me tell you something, brethren. This thing is so serious that in almost every book 
of the New Testament. I said almost every book of the New Testament, this word of God against adultery, he sounded forth. Let me conduct you through the New Testament, Matthew chapter 5. Reading verse 27, ye have heard that it was said by them of all time, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. Remember, lady, one person cannot commit adultery. It takes two people to fight. It takes two people to commit adultery. One person can steal all alone. One person can get angry all alone, but it takes two people to commit adultery. Perhaps you are exposing your nakedness and you are a partaker in that adultery. Perhaps it is the way you beg for gifts, running from brother to brother saying, I need money for house rent. I need money for food. And because of that, you make yourself so cheap. And you are everybody's girl, everybody's lady. They say, that sister, oh, she's so bold. She talks to anybody and she talks anyhow. And they know that sister, some of, some of us are even proud of it. They get into any vehicle, whatever. If an unbeliever comes to the, to, to the Bible study who is drinking and smoking and still having alcohol um, smelling in his mouth, but this person came with a car, they, you are sure that some sisters will go to the person and say, where are you going? Are you going to Ajegule or Agege or where are you going? If he says, well, I'm going, uh, he just opens the door. Even before the man says, come in, even to his sinner's car. We'll get into that car and the man may say, oh, why not sit in the front? And as they sit in the front, they begin to commit sin after Bible study. When you see some people weep at Bible study, you think they are repenting. They're only regretting they only have a remorse that the sins they have been committing, they are not able to break loose from them. They will come every Monday like God's people, come every, every Thursday like God's people, but they are never free from sin. Never, never free from sin. These are people who have useless visitation, sinful familiarity, and they have worldly pleasures, and they are just hoping that Jesus will not come. Well, whenever they hear that Jesus will come, they get a little bit afraid. They say, Jesus, be patient a little because I'm still committing sin. Jesus will come. He will come. He's not going to wait behind because of your carelessness. In Mark chapter 7, verse 21, For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness. Wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, and evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things, what are the evil things? Go back to verse 21 again. Evil thoughts are evil things. Adulteries are evil things. Fornications are evil things. And then it says all these evil things, they come from within and they defile the man. The New Testament says fornication and adultery defiles the man. In Luke chapter 18, Verse 20, thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery. That's Jesus talking and that's New Testament. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness. Honor thy father and thy mother. That's the word of God and that's still New Testament. In John chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. She must have been doing it in public. Otherwise, they wouldn't have been able to catch her in the very act. And they brought her right to the synagogue. She must have been doing it near the synagogue. Otherwise, the scribes and the Pharisees will not have been able to catch her. How many people use the vestry for adultery and for fornication? How many people come for choir practice in the evening and when the others are going, they meet in the vestry? The vestry is a small room where people uh, hang their choir robes just uh, before or after the choir song service and uh, even there in the darkness of the twilight, they begin to commit adultery. Right in the house of God, this woman 
committed adultery, near the house of God, she was caught and brought to the Lord Jesus Christ. True Jesus forgave, but he said, go and sin no more. If you are seeking forgiveness from the Lord, he is saying unto you too, go and sin no more. Acts chapter 15, verse 20 and verse 29. But that we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood. God expects New Testament believers who are experiencing the acts of the Holy Ghost in their lives to abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication. In verse 29, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication and from fornication and from fornication. That's the acts of the apostles. That's the New Testament. In almost every book it is written that fornication is evil. Fornication is immorality. Adultery is evil. And God will judge the adulterer. Romans chapter 1, verses 29 and 32. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, it tops the least. Because it is a common sin. It tops the least. It says fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. Go down to verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, the judgment of God against fornicators, against adulterers, that they which commit such sins are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Incidentally, in this chapter also, it talks about men working with men, that which is unseemly. What does that mean? A man sleeping together with another man. It's called sodomy. And when you do that, you're under the judgment of God. If you sleep with a man and behave with that man as if that man was a woman, that's sodomy and that is sin. It happens on the women's side too. If you sleep with a lady like yourself, those of you who are ladies and you are living together, sleeping on the same bed, and you will be robbing one another, uh, doing things with one another, as if that person were a man. It is sin. You, you may still come here and join the evangelism team. Still come here and do, go out on evangelism. Still come to distribute tracts. Still take cards and go to do visitation. But if you are doing anything like that, God knows the number of your house. He knows your name. He knows when the trumpet sounds like something you can shake yourself. You won't know the power is gone. You would have lost that magnet. You know, Jesus will act like a magnet. And you like a small magnet if you have that thing that has the magnet on within you. The Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God that keeps you away from anything that is of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit. And you shall not fulfill the laws of the flesh if you have that magnet within you. When that magnet appears in the sky, the magnet within you, the holiness and the purity, the mark of the blood of Jesus Christ, the clean and pure conscience, and the purity of heart will magnetize with the great magnet, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you'll go up in a twinkling of an eye. But if that magnet is lost, if that purity is lost, when Jesus comes, if you know that the saints have gone, you can shake, you can shout, you may try to have Judas type of repentance, try to weep, try to cast all the pictures, it's that time you'll be casting the pictures back to the boyfriend. Like Judas took the money back to the people that gave him the money. It's gone. It's gone. The opportunity is gone. They said, you see to that, that's your business, go and take care of the money. And that time there will be no chance to repent at all. This is the time to repent in Romans chapter 7 verse 3. Romans 7 3. So then, if while her husband lives, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. If your husband is alive and you divorce and you go to marry another person, that means if you are the first wife ever to be married to that man, and you divorce that man or you separate from that man and you go to marry Another person, you will be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no, no adulteress, though she be married to another man. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, I'm showing you through the books of the, of the New Testament. Some people say, we are not under the law, and because of that, they commit immorality, they commit sin. They commit fornication and adultery. They still keep what they call boyfriend or girlfriend 
after they say they are born again and they still be committing sin every Saturday, every open day from secondary school. Every time they go out from university, they still commit sin. And yet they say they are born again. They say, we are not under the law, but we are under the New Testament uh, rule, the New Testament standard. And you are seeing it in almost every book of the New Testament that adultery and fornication are condemned by the Lord. And even any appearance or similarity to any of these things. First, First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Didn't you know since we've been coming that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived by your thoughts. Be not deceived by the tracts you read from overseas. Be not deceived by the teaching of eternal security. There is no security for the sinning saint. There is no security for the sinning church goer. There is no security for the sinning person who says, I'm born again. Be not deceived by tracts, by books, by theology. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, no adulterers, no, Id no idolaters, no adulterers, no the effeminate. Those are the CC men. Those are the men who dress and talk and do their air like women. They look so delicately and they are vehicles and servants of sin. They are effeminate, no abusers of themselves with mankind. Those are the sodomites. Or those are, and those are the ladies too who do immorality with ladies like themselves. No thieves, no covetous, no drunkards, no revilers, no extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. This um, sin that says abusers of themselves with mankind is a very serious sin. There was um, a driver that came to me, a Christian, who had to give up his job. Why did he give up his job? He was driving for a European. And this European refused to marry. And whenever this European went into the house, they'll call this um, man who is a Christian, and he will call him to be on the bed so that they can have humanity together, a European. You'll think that if a person is driving for a European, he'll not have any problem here in this city of Lagos. And yet look at it in the word of God that it says, abusers of themselves with mankind, they shall not inherit the kingdom of God. No inheritance in the kingdom, whatever. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21, this thing must be serious for it to appear in almost every book of the New Testament. For the apostles, for the evangelists, for all the writers of the New Testament to be putting on the pressure on the believers that they should not mention such a sin in their midst. It must be pretty serious. Second Corinthians chapter 12 verse 21. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you that I shall be well many which have sinned already and am not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. Those are church members. Those are people who said they were born again in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through to verse 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery. Adultery is the work of the flesh, not the work of the spirit. Adultery is the work of the flesh, not the fruit of life. It's not the fruit of love like some people think. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, all those things are in the same family. Idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things, such things like what? Like adultery, like fornication, such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. They won't inherit the kingdom of God. In Ephesians chapter 5, looking at verse 3, But fornication and all uncleanness, all forms of uncleanness, looking at naked women on the bus, you know, you men, there are some men who deceive themselves, they say that they are born again, you sit with a lady right um, in the bus, and you know the lady, one of the children of the devil, for Jesus put it straight on them, he said, you have your father the devil. You know, there's no preacher like Jesus who is just going to tell you like you are. If he knows your family background that you are the devil, he's going to tell you that, the, that your father is the devil. 
and you know some children of the devil who are ladies in the bus, you see them exposing themselves and you'll see some so-called brothers, they'll be watching that TV. Oh, they say, I, I rejoice I don't have television in my house. What is that you are watching in the bus? I praise God I don't go to cinema houses anymore. What is that you are watching? What do they watch on the Indian film? More than what you are watching on the bus. More than what you see at the taxi. That's the same television. In fact, that's more serious than the television because you might sit beh uh, beside that person and you'll be feeling immorality and allowing that immorality. Some of the so-called brothers will not stop at the bus stop where they ought to stop because of the heat of sin that is upon their body. And they'll continue like that. And after that, they'll say, God, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Lord, I'm sorry. Give me back my sanctification. Is that so? You're deceiving yourself. You think that is Christianity? Or you are just coming, getting into the water. You are not cleansed, you are not washed. And you go back the same old, dirty, stinking, fornicating fellow. But fornication. And all uncleanness, our covetousness, let it not once be named among you. Those of you who have girlfriends in the Bible study, let it not be once named among you. Those of you visit one another and in the secret of your room, even though you are named with this Bible study, in the secret of your room, God knows your heart. He knows your life. He knows the pattern of your life. You are committing immorality. He says, let it not once be named among you if you've been coming here for seven years don't let it once be mentioned if you are going to be rebuked in this bible study let it be that you are rebuked because you didn't preach well let it be that you are rebuked because uh, maybe you wrote a tract and the english was not all right and we said you shouldn't have written english like that let your rebuke be on something that is not connected with sin don't let it be for fornication don't let us stand behind this pulpit and say we want to make a solemn serious announcement that so and so is under discipline because of fornication or adultery but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness let it not once be named among you as becometh saints as becometh saints we are saints we are not sinners in Colossians chapter 3 and in verse 5 mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, that means destroy them. Kill them. Mortify them. Fornication. Uncleanness. Inordinate affection. Evil concupiscence. Covetousness, which is idolatry. You know, evil concupiscence. Or inordinate affection. Some people can be committing sin with a picture. There are some men like that. Some ladies... Um, some ladies' pictures. It may even be pictures that people take in camp meetings. They look at a particular lady, and maybe the lady is not well-dressed. In the secret, they'll be looking at that picture. And with their hearts, they'll be thinking immorality. Well, that will not be right. That will not show that you, are, you have mortified the deeds of the flesh, but mortify them, destroy them. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 downwards. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the laws of concupiscence, are even as the Gentiles which know not God. Those who do not know God are the ones who are guilty of these sins. But as for us who are children of God, let it not be named among us. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lust. Flee also youthful lust. What does that mean? If you're sitting beside a lady anywhere and you find that you cannot control your thoughts and your hearts are running from immorality to fornication to adultery, and you are daydreaming there, the word of God says, flee also useful lost. Who was Paul writing to? A preacher. Timothy. He said, my son Timothy, his son in the faith, who was preaching the gospel, who was to teach aged men, aged women, young women, and young men. And yet he was commanding Timothy, he said, flee also useful lost. There are times you have to use your feet, use your legs to be free from sin. 
Sometimes it's not only prayer. Sometimes it's not only quoting a promise. Sometimes it's not only rebuking the devil. You have to use your legs to be free from sin. That young man, um, Joseph, was invited to sin by a woman. The woman said, come and commit sin with me because the husband was not at home. Joseph said, how shall I do this great wickedness and sin against my God? And that woman began to talk day in, day out. Just like your boss talks to you every day in the office to come and commit immorality. Just like the man talks to you as a maid in the house to come and commit immorality. Just like an old woman, you know some of the women who are married and they have lost their, their husbands. They might be 45 or 50, but they call a young boy of 22, a young man of 27, and they'll be doing immorality with them. And because the woman is um, elderly, the boy or the young man will not be able to talk, will just be restraining himself, will be saying, God, you know, I don't like this thing, but I don't want to be rude to this madam. I think we ought to be rude to such people. I think we ought to call the word of God to them. I think we ought to tell them the word of God and the word of the New Testament that this is adultery, this is immorality, whatever it is. And sometimes, you know, it may be a Bible study leader who has recommended you that will put you on the workers' retreat. And um, because of that, he himself might have been backslidden long time ago. And whenever you go to visit him, he tries to do something. to say, oh, but you know, this is not good. You shouldn't hear this at the Bible study. He says, yes, I know. God will forgive us. Uh, it is because I am feeling uh, very, very bad. And uh, you will be punishing me if I don't do this thing. And then you just keep quiet like that to say, if I talk, if I try to resist it, he might report me to the ministry and tell lies against me, and they remove me from the workers' retreat. They won't remove you from workers' retreat, but God will remove your name out of the book of life. And you can choose which one you prefer, to remain in the workers' retreat under the pretense of living a righteous life, because the person who introduced you there is committing sin with you, Remain at the workers' retreat. You will keep on at the workers' retreat till Jesus comes. And when Jesus comes and the saints are going home, you will continue with workers' retreat here in Lagos. But the word of God is very clear. Telling this Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22, Flee also, useful laws, but follow righteousness. Where you see righteousness, run after righteousness. Where you see sanctification, purity and holiness being preached, run after holiness. If a preacher of holiness who is living a holy life, might you, be so with weep, or with the Lord, and he drives you away, run after him. If a person who is helping you to live a sanctified life, teaching you the word of God, is rebuking you, is correcting you, and is driving you away, flee after him, run after him, but run from fornication. If your church pastor is inviting you to sin, run away. If your Sunday school teacher is inviting you to sin, run away. If your boss is inviting you to sin, run away. But where you see holiness preaching, preaching of purity, preaching of righteousness, run after them. If they are going to Kaduna to have the retreat and they are going to stress holiness, run after them. If they are going to Ghana, anywhere you can find the word of God, anywhere on earth, where you can find the word of God, run after them, follow after righteousness, after faith, charity, peace, with them that call on the name of the Lord, with them that call on the Lord, out of a pure heart. Join such people. Who are calling on the Lord out of a pure heart. In Titus chapter 2 we are told for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all men. And in chapter 2 verse 12 we are told teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust we should lay soberly, righteously and godly in this present world. Do you know we can live righteously in this present world? If you make up your mind tonight and say, I live righteously. I believe the Lord himself will grant you the power, the grace and the strength to live a righteous life in Hebrews chapter 13. And in verse 4, marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But all mongers and adulterers, God will judge. God will judge all mongers and adulterers. In James chapter 2, right in verse 11. For he that says, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. And in chapter 4, verse 4 of James, it says, ye adulterers and adulteresses. Know ye not the friendship of the world? 
is enmity with God. Know you not that girlfriend, boyfriend, relationship is friendship of the world, and that's enmity with God. Know you not that friendship of the world, in the world pattern, in the worldless system, is enmity with God, whoso therefore will be a friend of the world, is the enemy of God. And in First Peter chapter 2, verse 11, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. That's the target of the devil. He wants to make war with your soul. And he wants that soul to be lost in hellfire. That's why he's bringing the tendency to want to go and commit that immorality. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles, when we were in lasciviousness, lost, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries, when they think it strange that ye run not with them to the same excess of fire, speaking evil of you. In Second Peter chapter 2, verse 14, having eyes full of adultery. You know what that means? When you look at some ladies, if you don't um, turn off your eyes, they can catch you with their eyelids, with their eyelashes, with the way they make their face, with the way they dress their hair, their eyes, and even the very eyeballs are full of adultery. Sometimes when some people come for counseling, you just have to look away from their eyes because they really don't want counseling. They want a sin partner, they want a friend in sin, for they have eyes full of adultery. A person's eyes can be full of adultery. Her language can be full of adultery. Her tendencies and the way she does things can be full of adultery. That when she relates with people or talks with people or visits people, the tendency you will feel is in a tendency of adultery. And they cannot cease from sin. They guiding unstable souls. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices caused children, caused by God. They are caused because of their sin. And in First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, from verse 15, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, that is it, the adultery, the fornication, the uncleanness, the evil, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, the evil desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, it is of the world. It is of the world. And the world passes away. And the lost thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. In Jude verse 7. Jude verse 7. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner giving themselves over to fornication, going after strange flesh, are set forth for an example suffering vengeance of eternal fire. That's the end of fornicators. Eternal fire, eternal bonus, eternal punishment. Revelation chapter 2, verse 14. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there, there <clears throat> that holds the doctrine of Bela, who taught Bela to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat sin sacrifice to idols, and to commit fornication. It was in the church. And Jesus said, you have some people in the midst who cancel, who teach, who entice other people to commit fornication and to commit adultery. We never can tell. They may be here. Self-styled preachers, self-styled prophets. You have prayer meetings together with them in their homes in the night. They come out with prophecy and they say, God says the Lord after you've married and you have your own wife. And they say they see another beautiful lady that God is going to give you. They say don't tell anybody at the Bible study because this is what God has revealed. Will God reveal that a man will go and take a second wife and commit adultery? Will he do that by prophecy when his word has gone against it? Or at other times when you have been taught the word of God like this, you are sure to find somebody who will come and say, well, that thing you heard at the Bible study, don't follow them in all their sin. Those people, they are very extreme. God cannot judge us like they are saying. 
and then they begin to teach their own Bible study, maybe 30 minutes after the Bible study, they are reteaching that fellow, telling the person, it is not bad, or you might have invited somebody to the Bible study that you committed sin with yesterday. And as the person is there now, and uh, maybe at the time of the prayer, you are looking for that person, so that that person will not completely repent. If you see the person weeping, and after the Bible study, you go to her, and you say, well, God has forgiven us. He knows that it is his will that we marry. All those things they are saying, it, this is not what they mean. Then you begin to reteach her so that she will still continue with you in committing that sin. Or you might be a lady that is popular, popular in the ministry. You never can tell what people do in secret. We don't know. But we'll tell you everything so that on the last day you wouldn't say, we didn't tell you. You'll know that we told you. And God knows that we're telling you. You may be a lady that will be bringing other people into sin. And when a message like this goes forth, instead of repenting, you will be comforting your sin partners who will say, well, don't mind all those things they are saying. God is very soft. We know the promises of God. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Or if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And be quoting those um, emergency promises that are meant to deliver people who just fall into sin on emergency. They didn't mean to do it. They are not making it a habit, but just out of temptation. Because they were careless, just in emergency, when they sin like that, it says, little children, these things are right unto you, that you may not sin, but if in emergency you sin, we have an advocate with the Father, and the verses that are reaching for emergency case will be quoting for your habit. But God knows you. And God was telling this, a saint and this angel of the church that you have a person there that is teaching other people to commit fornication. In this same chapter 2 verse 20, notwithstanding I have a few things against thee, because thou suffered that woman, Jezebel. You know Jezebel? He was in the Old Testament. She was in the Old Testament. But another person, a namesake, it was the same character appeared in this New Testament church which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, but she repented not. Sinners enjoy their sins. Fornicators enjoy their fornication. Adulterers enjoy their adultery, and therefore they will not repent. And God said he will bring her to judgment. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, bed of affliction. And them that commit adultery with her into, a, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. If you commit adultery with any person in this Bible study, if you entice anyone into sin, you sin against God the Father who has given the commandment. You sin against Jesus Christ who has purchased that person with the blood that is shed on Calvary. You sin against the Holy Spirit. I don't mean the unpardonable sin, but you sin against the Holy Spirit who has made sure that that person received a witness and has ministered salvation unto that person. You sin against the preacher who is watching over the souls of all the brethren because he is going to give an account because to make his work to be more difficult. He builds up by preaching and teaching and you tear down by alluring them into sin. You sin against the father of that lady. You sin against the mother of that lady. You sin against that lady herself and you sin against the husband that will eventually marry that lady. You are sinning against heaven and against earth. If you are sinning against God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, sinning against the preacher, sinning against the church, sinning against that lady herself, sinning against her father, sinning against her mother, and sinning against her husband-to-be, your sin is great. Except you repent, thou shalt likewise perish. Let us pray. We thank you because there is power in your word to deliver. Power to set free. You set drunkards free. You set murderers free. And you can set adulterers and fornicators free. 
We are praying for anyone here tonight who is eager to be set free. Praying and asking, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Father, we pray that in the mighty, powerful, all-sufficient name of Jesus, deliver them in Jesus' name. <laughs> Cleanse every one of us from every appearance of evil. Purge this whole Bible study. Purge every heart. Purge our language. Purge our dressing. Purge our visitation. We pray that if there is anything we do, directly or indirectly, that has a tendency to immorality, cleanse everyone in Jesus' name. Give us your power and your spirit so that even in secret, in the corner of our houses, we'll be living holy and pure lives in Jesus' name. Turn our weakness to strength. When the devil brings evil thoughts, help us to resist them. As we go about our work in offices, get on the bus, we have changed, the world has not changed. Therefore, they will still dress like they do, still talk like they talk, and still do things they have always been doing. But Father, when it is necessary to close our eyes, keep our eyes closed. When it is necessary to walk away from their company, give us strength in our feet to walk away from sin. Break any friendship between us and anybody that is producing sin in our lives. We pray for those who are in courtship, even though they know your will, that they will get married. If they will do anything that is off the point, you will be angry against them. Because you wouldn't want your will to be mixed with immorality. And if they do, your spirit will leave them. Your power will leave them. And it will just be figureheads if they are preachers. If they are counselors, if they are Sunday school teachers in churches, they will just be shouting and it will not be effective. Father, we pray for everybody coming to this Bible study that whether they are in courtship or not, in whatever situation in life they are, keep them away from sin in Jesus' name. <laughs> Father, we even pray for those who are married. Because sometimes, they still continue in that way. After the wife was put to bed, six months after, the woman is pregnant again. Because they are not able to control themselves. And they use the marriage to propagate the lust of the flesh. And the woman becomes weak, without strength, and will be suffering untold anguish. Father, we pray for the married people that will grant themselves control.